And thank you all so much for being here, and uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Okay, so um, my talk today is going to focus on post traumatic growth. Um, and I thought that, you know, given the interest that you all have in global health, uh, I would sort of, in a sense, give you a sense of my journey to this research topic. Um, before I do that, I want to thank my many collaborators on this uh, line of research. I specifically want to acknowledge Laura Blackie, who was my former postdoc over the last couple of years, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham, uh, and Nuan Jayavikrama, who is my identical twin brother. Aww. He's not the one giving the speech right now. Uh, but uh, he is a clinical psychologist who's an assistant professor at Manhattan College, and he, uh, we have collaborated together on a couple of the studies that I'll be presented at the beginning of this presentation. Um, also, um, as Bonnie mentioned, this research has been supported by the Educator Foundation, USAID, and the John Templeton Foundation. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a story from, with multiple acts. Um, and it starts with my skepticism that a concept like post-traumatic growth could even make sense to begin with. Um, my early work in mental health was as a graduate student 10 years ago. Um, when I was doing field research in Sri Lanka. And for those of you who don't know, Sri Lanka had a long-running civil war that lasted from 1983 to 2009. Um, around 100,000 people were killed over the course of those years. Um, and there was an, a large amount of civilians, mostly, much mostly Tamil, who were displaced from the north and east of the country. Now, we recently finished a qualitative study where we interviewed 50 survivors of the Civil War from three districts in the northeast of the country. Right? So the reason why I want to start with this study is that this is qualitative data collected from people five years after the end of the Civil War. Um, and the reason why we collected this data is that we wanted to try and understand the way in which people talk about their adjustment to life after the conflict and some of the major problems, the ma major psychosocial struggles that they're dealing with. Right? So just to give you a sense of what, where Sri Lanka is, uh, that when I was a college student here in the United States, I remember telling someone from Sri Lanka, and that person asked me whether it was near West Virginia. So <laughs> Sri Lanka is near India. <laughs> um, no further away. And the northern province and the eastern province, Right, so this northern section and this eastern section were the two areas that were claimed by a group called the Liberation Tigers Tamil Elam uh, as a separate homeland for the minority Tamil population. And this led to a long-running civil war. Um, so these are people that were collected with the support of the Family Rehabilitation Center, which is the first locally run, locally founded nonprofit, and I've had the privilege to work with them on multiple studies. Uh, it was a semi-structured interview and the interviews were con conducted in the native language of the interview of the participants, and we use open and actual coding to extract the main themes. This is what people talk about for the most part. For the most part. Um, and you can see from the list that it's not a particularly positive list. Right. Uh, psychosomatic problems, thinking too much. Right. Uh, Problems associated with basic needs, right? Financial problems, worrying about their children's future. And when they were asked to talk about how they managed with these problems, they spoke about religious rituals, distraction, engaging with each other, right? So it wasn't clear that any benefits came out, right? This idea of silver linings, right? There's no sense that there were any clear silver linings that came out of the company. <coughs> and if anything, one theme that came out of the data was that. To the extent to which people talked about their problems, some people thought that talking about the problems was a sign of weakness. And that was actually, you were, one was actually better off trying to deal with their challenges by themselves. So, the people who have gone through the Civil War in Sri Lanka have been significantly, have gone through significant trauma. In one of, um, my early papers with uh, my twin brother that was published in Psych Psychological Assessment, we, we developed a questionnaire um, that tried to identify the types of trauma people in Sri Lanka ex experience, the daily struggles 
that people go through, right? That can be independent of the specific <coughs> trauma that might uh, qualify them for a diagnosis of PTSD, and some of the symptoms of anxiety and depression that they might experience. So, these are the types of traumas that they experience. Now, as you can see, three quarters of the sample in our, in our uh, of the, uh, three quarters of the sample, I think it was 200 people in the sample, had experienced a non torture trauma at least once. But half the sample had experienced torture at least one, at, at least one occasion. <coughs> we also looked at the types of daily problems that these people experience. And we found that on average, people had pretty high levels of economic problems and moderately high levels of basic need related problems. The, psych the psychological assessment paper focused on looking at the extent to which people's symptoms of anxiety and depression were unique compared to the way in which people typically, well, not typically, the way in which people in Western samples express depression. So in, in, in Sri Lanka, most hospitals assess depression and PTSD using standard psychometric instruments that were originally validated among US samples. Right? So for example, the big depression inventory is the most widely used measure of depression. So one question we had was whether a measure of depression and anxiety that incorporated local idioms of distress, they incorporated items that reflect the way in which people on the ground spoke about their mental illness, better predicted functioning impairment compared to these standard measures. And what we found is that these two, two of the three subscales, the anxiety and depression subscale, did predict functioning impairment over and above demographic variables and the two standard measures of PTSD and the Beck Depression Inventory, and as well as the Beck Depression Inventory. We had a third measuring, a third subscale there, the negative perception subscale, that was not predictive. Okay, so when you put all this in, into a path model, trauma has a direct relationship on psychopathology. Here, psychopathology is a combination of anxiety and depression, the two subscales from our measure. And we want to see the relationship of different types of life problems. See whether daily life problems had a unique impact on psychopathology over and above people's experience of war-related trauma. But if you remember, we measured them using separate sections of the questionnaire. And here's what we found. What you see is that age has a unique relationship. Um, with uh, psychopathology, <coughs> such that the older you were, the more likely you were to uh, experience levels of psychopathology. And family, pro family problems, economic problems, and physical problems also had an impact on people's level of psychopathology. And that mediated a relationship between trauma and psychopathology. So, just to sum summarize, Family problems and physical problems mediated the relationship between trauma and psychopathology. For social problems, the relationship with trauma was close to significant, but it didn't, approach, it didn't reach significance, but it had a direct impact on psychopathology. And age was an independent predictor of distress. And what's interesting is that the mediation model that I presented there, accounted for 41% of the variance. So what's hard about these people's lives is not just the fact they experienced this significant traumatic event, and this sample was pretty significantly traumatized, it was also that they had to deal with these daily stresses. So, given what I've just um, presented to you, right, on the nature of this population, how did I get interested in post-traumatic growth? That's a question I ask myself sometimes. <laughs> but one thing that happened when I was doing this research was I would talk to I would talk to counselors, right? People who would speak 
to these uh, participants when they came to the Family Rehabilitation Center to talk uh, uh, to counselors and other people to get treatment, right? They, the Family Rehabilitation Center provided counseling and physiotherapy for the most part. And what they would say is that, well, at some point when you, when you do therapy with them, you can't just talk about this one event that happened to them that they have to work through, right? Because every time they come to talk to you, there are new events to talk about, right? When they're struggling with life, the reason why they're struggling with life from session to session is because of something different. So at some point, the <coughs> counselors get frustrated because they, they, can't, they can't get any improvement going, right? Because it's just one bad thing happening after another. So when we would talk about this idea of post-traumatic growth, they got very excited because they said, well, this is something that useful that we could use. This is a new tool, right? This is something that we could maybe at least use to try and reframe the way they think about the world because at least not coming here and talking more and more about the bad things in their life and leaving more depressed. So does it make sense to talk about positive outcomes in such context, right? So at least when you talk to people on the ground, the counselors, many counselors say, it just makes sense because it gives them more tools. But there's another reason why it makes sense. So when people experience, you know, extreme hardship, like the samples I've spoken about in Sri Lanka, right? They go through all types of challenges. So I mentioned that the lack of basic needs, insecurity, same for social problems, possible persecution, right? Which is definitely the case in the early samples we collected in Sri Lanka. Potential exile from their homes. Most of the sample we looked at was displaced from their homes. Does it make sense to talk about positive outcomes? Does it make sense to talk about their well-being? One of the critiques of the mental health literature and of uh, the global health literature, at least has been made from people working in Sri Lanka, right, has been that a lot of the research is focused on the mental health of these samples has focused on the mental health described in terms of PTSD, or described in terms of the levels of depression. And it's true that being through, you know, uh, compared to our lives, you know, terrible, terrible tragedies, but that only captures one dimension of their lives. So this is a picture I took, uh, it's a public access picture. Right? So, um, there's no problem putting the faces up here, but it's also true that people, even in the worst circumstances, somehow manage to maintain adequate levels of functioning. Right? People manage. <coughs> so one of the challenges of using a single lens to assess the well-being of displaced populations, war affected populations, is that you end up getting a lopsided view of their quality of life. So this is a quote from a UNHCR report that came out a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, well-being among, in refugee camps. And this is a quote from a program coordinator. Um, when you come and say, now my refugees have come, I know that you are suffering, surely they will tell you problems. But if you come and ask them, how are things, how is your harvest, what have you done this year, you get a different answer. Very often people come to find out what problems are here, what can still be done, and maybe sometimes that's the reason why only negative answers are given. So the point that the coordinator is making here is that sometimes you can only get the answers to the questions you're interested in asking. So the point the so the authors report say made the point that maybe we should instead of imposing a particular lens on the refugees as victims, as people who are, you know who must be suffering from significant distress because of what they're being through, we should simply ask them, what is your quality of life? How are you doing? As opposed to assuming that this pop these populations must be going through significant strife because of their experiences. So going back to my, uh, my first study, we did attempt to do this. We looked at 700 interviews assessing quality, uh, psychological well-being collected in the north and east of the country during the ceasefire. So the war ended in 2009, but there was a brief ceasefire in 2006. So these interviews were collected from, I think, 
10 different centers in northeastern Sri Lanka. And these are some of the responses people provided. Um, they spoke about being motivated to accomplish their daily life tasks. They spoke about fulfilling the needs of their family. They spoke about having adequate status in their community. And they spoke about fulfilling responsibilities related to their religion. So, I, don't, I unfortunately don't have time to go into these data more uh, in greater detail, but those are the three broad dimensions that these items fell into. Fulfilling responsibilities, having status in your community, and fulfilling your religious responsibilities. <laughs> so, that's Sri Lanka. I next had the opportunity to go to Rwanda. Uh, and this was maybe six, six or seven years ago. And here, I adopted a more well-being focused approach. Um, so this is data we collected from 200 genocide survivors in five districts around the capital city, around Kigali. Um, so just in case, you know, some, many of you might be aware of the history of Rwanda, some of you might not be, but very briefly, there were two groups, there are, there are three groups, it's also the Twa community, but there, there, there are the Twa community, which is a minor, very much a minority community, they're the Hutus and the Tutsis. Right? The Hutus were the, were the majority community, and the Tutsis were the minority. The Tutsis enjoyed patronage <coughs> during the times of the German and Belgian colonizers, um, and there was a Tutsi monarchy that ruled over the country. A few years after independence, there was a revolt in 1959, which led to the rise of the party of the Hutu Emancipation Movement. This led to a large number of Tutsis leaving the country and going to places like Uganda. And then, in 1973, uh, Habiyama, uh, Habiyama, uh, who was a general, became president after a coup. And he led the country for <coughs> around 21 years. In 1990, they, the, the Tutsis who had fled the country after the Hutu revolt, right, which happened, I think, a couple of years before independence, invaded Rwanda. So the Rwanda Patriotic Front that led the invasion, this is the group that now runs the country. And Paul Kagame, who is a uh, who is a president, was a general at that time. There was a ceasefire in 1992, and they were working their way through some type of final peace agreement. When, on April 6, 1980, April 6, 1994, April 6, 1980, unfortunately, it's my birthday, so I don't know why I put that up there. <laughs> 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 April 6, 1994. That's a really bad Freudian slip. Harvey um, Arbor's <laughs> plane was shot down over Kigali, which was an excuse for the inter Harmbe, which was a group of militia that was supported by the government, to embark on a two-month-long killing spree. No one, there isn't a final number of how many people were killed. People estimate up to a million people were killed. Right? Now, estimates go from like 800,000 to more than a million. Two million people read, fled Rwanda, and one million people were displaced internally. And the genocide only ended when the RPF in invaded Rwanda from <coughs> If they hadn't invaded, it's likely that the genocide would have concluded successfully. Because as you know, the international community didn't do too much. So, um, in 1996, there's a repatri repatriation of refugees living out in the neighboring countries. And since then, Paul Kagame has run the country. And for those of you who have been following the news, he's run the country with an increasingly authoritarian hand. So, that's Rwanda. When we did our study there, we were interested in the value of positive constructs. Right? We were interested, okay, to the extent to which people are able to maintain positive uh, levels of functioning 15 years post-genocide. What are the personal resources that they that they have that promote this functioning. 
So we looked at a particular resource that's very similar to self-efficacy. Right? It's pretty much identical to self-efficacy. It's called Personal Growth Initiative, which is the, which measures the extent to which an individual intentionally makes life choices to promote his or her self-improvement. So it's a form of self-efficacy where you feel confident that you can make yourself a better person. So here's some items. I know how to change the specific things I want to change in my life. I have a specific action plan to help me reach my goals. Um, here are the means. The reason, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but these numbers, post, the post traumatic growth levels here were pretty low compared to other samples. So one thing that was surprised about this sample was that compared to other samples they collected, especially in Sri Lanka, where those people had just recently come out of the, of the Civil War, the overall mental health levels of this sample were, low, were pretty low. Um, here are some correlations. We found that personal growth uh, initiative was positive, negatively related to physical functioning. What that means is that the higher your levels of personal growth initiative, the lower your levels of fit, uh, functional impairment. Right? So your functioning is better if you have higher levels of personal growth. Um, we did a regression analysis to see whether personal growth initiative <coughs> moderated the relationship between depression and physical functioning. So what we did was that we wanted to see whether if people experience symptoms of depression, is there something about personal growth initiative that enables them to still function despite the fact that they have symptoms of depression. And we found, we found some evidence of this. So it seems that if you're high on personal growth initiative, your degree of functional impairment doesn't increase to the same degree as you would if you scored low on personal growth initiative. So this uh, we publish in Psychological Trauma, I think. We also collected qualitative data from these participants and we asked them, how have you changed since 1994? In what way has your life changed? We wanted to ask them, give them an open a question. And what they responded, and this is just a summary of the codings um, that we did. And the, this coding strategy was very similar to the coding strategy of the previous two studies. Changes in basic needs. For the most part, everyone said that their material welfare had improved. Had improved. They had specific aspirations. Most people said they wanted to get a better education, they want to get on in life, they want to do better. Everyone said that. And unfortunately, they also said that the quality of their relationships had suffered, that they felt that they had a reduced level of trust in their community. So that was an example of negative change. So on, on the face of it, it would seem, OK, if you ask people in a specific community, in what life has your life changed <coughs> since tonight, in the wake of a trauma, they will give you some pretty reasonable answers. So here's the thing. The Rwanda government has been heavily promoting the idea that, we, that people in Rwanda should overcome the genocide, that the genocide is something we should overcome and grow from. And one thing that was striking about these interviews is that these themes came out consistently across all <coughs> the narratives, which makes it very likely that what was happening here is that people were giving us a socially desirable response that matched up with the cultural narrative that was present. And informally, I can say that in conversations with clinical psychologists, we have worked with, from, with the genocide survivors. There does seem to be a mismatch between these data and what people tell, talk about in private. So one of the challenges with in, interpreting this data is that it's unclear what these narratives are actually telling us. Are they telling us something about the ways in which people's lives have actually changed? Or are they telling us something interesting about the cultural narrative that contemporary Rwandan society is steeped in? So, you might have noticed that thus far, I have been dancing around the question of what post-traumatic growth actually is. Right? We sort of getting closer and closer to this question. So let's answer this question. Right? 
The reason why I brought up this challenge of interpreting the quarterly results from the random sample is that this idea, this cultural idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? That people attribute to Frederick Nietzsche or Kanye West or Kelly Clarkson, right? <laughs> depending on your cultural touchstone, um, is a very pervasive idea. Right? It's not only a pervasive idea, it's something that probably all of us can relate to when we think about our lives, right? If you think about your life narrative, you can probably think of one story in your life that you can frame in terms of growth narrative, right? This didn't happen to me, this person did something to me, it knocked me down and then I got up again, you know? I'm not going to quote the rest of that song. But, <laughs> but the point is that you can think of times in your life that map onto these either post traumatic growth. So it is a very persuasive idea. And on, if especially these days, now that psychology, it seems, has gotten a lot of cachet in popular media, right? You read about psychology studies in Cosmopolitan, in men's health, on the internet. There are lots more articles coming out now about how people change and grow as a result of adversity. This is an article that came out last year in Vox, right? Vox.com, which is a data-driven news site. So, post traumatic growth is an idea that become more popular recently. It's been defined as positive psychological changes experienced as a result of struggling with highly challenging life circumstances. So this is the definition. So the idea here is that it's something about going through a trauma that makes you a better person. Right? You were person A before the trauma, but then because of the experience, you are a different person in some important way and in a better way. So it's something that resonates very strongly with our lives, as I mentioned. People are drawn to these stories, and there's a lot of interest in the research now. And there's a lot of research out there. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago with my former postdoc. But there have been around 100 articles that have come out in the two years since we wrote that paper. There is a lot of interest. And the fact that this is an idea that <coughs> is appealing, and the fact that there's a lot of interest, should, if you're a scientist, or a budding scientist, or an aspirational scientist, should give you some pause because you have to be careful <coughs> about the quality of research you're doing for two reasons. One is that because of the, of the appeal of the message that yes, I went through this bad thing but I came out stronger than before, we're going to be very likely to buy into any research finding that comes up. And maybe pay less attention to the methodological limitations of any given study. But more problematic, post traumatic growth does carry with it the challenge of saying trauma is good for you. Right. Now, at some level, I think most of us would agree that going through some type of mild adversity is probably good for you, right? In a sense that you won't know what your limitations are, you won't know the nature of your personality, you won't grow, you won't get a sense of what the world is like, unless you get, you know, you go through some degree of strife, right? We're not talking high level stuff, not talking trauma, but you know, this, you do learn about yourself when you're pushed hard as a student, when you have to work hard with your job, when you encounter failures in both those domains, when you go through breakups, right? You learn something about yourself. But that is a different message from saying that, you know, when this terrible, you know, war trauma happens to you, well, don't worry about it because at some point you're gonna realize you're a better person for it. Right? So there are dangers that are implicit with post-traumatic growth. So let me back up to my research in Sri Lanka and Rwanda. So by the time I was in Rwanda, I was pretty interested in post-traumatic growth. In part because I realized that <coughs> simply, simply identifying the levels of depression and PTSD didn't completely capture right, <coughs> the function of the samples we were working with. Um, but it, I also realized when I started examining these measures of post-traumatic growth that they really weren't doing a good job measuring what they claim to be measuring. So remember I said that post-traumatic growth is positive psychological changes right, after a traumatic event. 
That involves prospective data. It involves you having some information <coughs> on how the person was before and how the person was after the trauma, because that's how you get a change score, right? Most studies in post-traumatic growth don't have prospective data. So they rely on a measure called the post-traumatic growth inventory. The post-traumatic growth inventory asks you, how much do you think you become more religious? <coughs> how much do you think you sense new opportunities in life because, since, because of the trauma? Or since the trauma, how much do you think you should become uh, more open to new possibilities because of that event? Now, on the face of it, it seems like a very clear measure, right? You're asking people, how much do you think you've changed because of the trauma? That's pretty much what you're asking. But the problem there is that you're in fact asking people to do a very complicated set of mental and arithmetic, right? When it comes to their psychological states, right? You're asking people to think how they're doing right now in terms of their, the extent to which they see themselves as spiritual, for example. Then you're asking them to think about how much, to what degree were they spiritual or religious before the stressful life event. Then you're asking them to do some math and calculate the number. And then you're asking them to attribute how much of that change was due to the stressful life event. It's unclear whether we are even able to do that, right? Now, there are two issues here. One is that the measure is retrospective. So you're asking people to tell you how much you think you changed. <coughs> now, how likely would you be to accept a measure of depression that uses the same technique? Right? If I give you a measure of depression and a measure of depression asks, tell me how much you think you changed on depression over the last two weeks. And that was the measure of depression that I used. Right? If I want to know how much your depression has changed over the last two weeks, I'll ask you two weeks earlier and then I'll ask you now. And it turns out over at least three studies have looked at this. The correlation between your perceived change and your uh, prospective change scores is around 0.2 to 0.3. So the retrospective measure captures some degree of that change, but there's a lot of variance there that's unexplained. The other problem, though, is that the measure is asking people to tell you how much you change because of an event. And we know from classic uh, studies done in the social psychology literature that we actually don't know why we change. Right? The cognitive dissonance literature tells us this, that we don't have that degree of introspection. I can tell you a story about why I become a different person in my 30s. Because I moved to the South, right? Uh, because um, I, had, I had new responsibilities in my job. But it could have easily been because of you know, normative brain development, right? When you get into your 30s, you chill out. <laughs> but, but the point is that there's a difference between the story I tell about myself and what's actually happening. So, the post traumatic growth inventory is probably some type of interesting metacognitive measure that tells you about what it means, <coughs> what, you know, the extent to which people attribute change to a traumatic event. Right? That's, what, that's what the measure is telling you. It's not telling you about whether people actually become better people. So, when we look at people's scores in a post traumatic growth inventory, the variability in the scores could reflect actual growth, because the correlation was 0.2. It could reflect the fact that social psychology research has found that when people think about themselves in terms of growth variables, when people attribute growth to their behavior, it actually helps dampen levels of negative mood. So it could be a coping strategy to believe that you've grown. As I mentioned earlier, there might be cultural beliefs at hand, which could be true in Rwanda, and I think it's definitely true in the United States. And it could be denial. When people are suffering, sometimes they feel as if they can't tell you the truth about their suffering. So they have to say, yeah, things are great, I'm strong. I've never been stronger. So, we recently, published a couple of papers. Um, this is the a target article where we laid out some of the criticisms of the post traumatic growth literature. We had 15 researchers write, write responses and then uh, we wrote back. Um, and if you're interested in this issue, I suggest you read the whole thing. It's not just our view, but the view of the 15 uh, 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 commentators because it's, they're very thoughtful. And the question is, how do you do better research, right? 
how can you move beyond the self-report measures? One way is to use informant reports. Right? So this is a study that we did among low-income populations, mostly African-American, a mostly African-American sample that met the criteria for clinical trauma in winston Salem. And what we did is that we looked not only at the degree to which people agreed on their post traumatic growth levels, but also on the extent to which people agreed on the relative standing of different post traumatic growth relevant dimensions. Right? So just to explain, you know that people, humans, because we're human, we self-enhance, right? We think we're pretty good on a, in general, right? You ask people, humans about their abilities, about their personality strengths, we end up, we usually rate ourselves a little higher than we actually are. So any correlation between an informant and an individual is going to be low in part because of that bias, right? But you can get around that by looking at the correlation between a person's profile across multiple states. So even though my profile might be higher on the graph, if the shape of the profile is the same as the informant's profile of me, right? So if my level of appreciation relative to my levels of thinking the new possibilities in my life compared to my levels of thinking I'm a, I'm a stronger person, if my relative ratings to each other are the same as my informant's ratings of me, that means we at least agree on that, right? We agree on the relative standing of, of my traits. So we looked at that, right? So we did a profile correlation. And a positive profile correlation indicates that people agree on the pattern of traits. So we have data on this. We collected new data from Sri Lanka and Rwanda. We had self and informant reports. And we'll talk a bit about the uh, North Carolina sample because I've already spoken about data from Sri Lanka and Rwanda. And what we found is that there is some evidence that people do agree on these group reports, that the self and the informants agree at least on the shape of their different trait standards. We also did a form of profile agreement, excuse me, where we actually controlled for the mean level for each trait. And the reason why we did this is that we wanted to control for the possibility that people might be using stereotypic judgments when judging individuals. Because as I mentioned earlier, especially in the United States, people might just assume someone has grown, right? So when they judge a target, they might just say, oh, this person is as clearly a four out of five, because <coughs> it's not because the person might have grown, but because people grow in general. So this is a much more rigorous analysis, and we found some evidence for profile agreement there. We also had some participants who provided more than one informant. So we looked at profile agreement among the two informants, which is a much more conservative test of the hypothesis. So we didn't look at the correlation between the target and the informant. We looked at the correlation between two informants on the target's behavior. And we found over evidence for overall agreement, but not for <coughs> distinct agreement. Uh, this paper came out last year in social and social psychological and personality science, I think. So that's one way of maybe doing better research in post-traumatic growth. A second way is to think about what real post-traumatic growth is and how you would measure it. So one of my senior colleagues made the point that if people tell you they become better people, right? if they say, because of this terrible event, I'm now more altruistic, I go give to charity, right? or I feel like I'm a kinder person, well, those behaviors should show up in your everyday life. Right? If I told you I was a much more altruistic person, but, and then you realize that compared to the past, in my daily life, you didn't see any evidence for that change, then it's unclear whether what I'm saying about my change is meaningful or whether it's just a story I'm telling about myself. Right? So, time people's reports of personality change to actual daily <coughs> behavior is a second approach. So in this study, which we published, just published in Journal of Research in Personality, we tracked, we attempted to track every Wake Forest undergraduate um, a year and a half ago. 
and we entered every student who over the course of the semester reported a, clinic, a trauma that could be classified as a clinical trauma into this study. And you can see that the yield was very low, right? which is great, great for them. Right? I'm glad very few students experienced a clinical trauma, but it meant that we had a very small yield for this study. And we created a daily measure of post-traumatic growth. So there are five dimensions of post-traumatic growth that have been identified in prior literature. Quality relationships, increased spirituality, appreciation of life, new possibilities, and having personal strength. And we created a measure that enabled us to assess to, to the extent to which people enacted relevant behaviors or had growth relevant cognition at a daily level. And over a nine day period, we assessed this group of students and a control group of 30 undergraduates on this measure five times a day. So what we found is that people's daily post-traumatic growth varied from day to day, right? which is good. It wasn't as if they were just given the same score. But what we also found, found was that out of the five dimensions that I just presented to you, only trait spirituality, right? Only the spirituality dimension predicted people's behaviors on the daily measure. Now, one of the implications is that it means it's unclear whether the post traumatic growth inventory is actually capturing meaningful change. <coughs> now, because the study was, uh, the yield from the Wake Forest sample was so low, there are some sample size issues, right? So it's, I won't say yet that we can generalize this finding. But what we're doing now is that we are tracking 800 people every week for one year. And the site's gonna end, um, I think, in seven weeks. Where every week we're assessing them on five different dimensions relating to post-traumatic growth, as well as situation contingencies that predict those behaviors. So instead of just asking them, how much did you uh, experience high levels of relationships today? Or were you authentic today? We're asking them, okay, did, did you experience high levels of uh, authenticity today? In what context? Where did it happen to you? So we can get a much fine, much more fine-grained assessment of the extent to which specific situational context can promote growth-related behaviors. And the hope here is that over the course of a year, a subset of these 800 people will experience different types of trauma, so we can look at the micro-level trajectory of how people change as a, as a result of experiencing an adverse life event. Okay, so I'm gonna leave some time for questions. So I'm gonna wrap up. Going forward, how can we do better quality research? Right. One thing is that people who are, do, who are interested in research need to pay more attention to the measures they're using. Right. There are questions about using retrospective reports. Um, there are also problems with self-report. Right? What are the conditions under which we may or may not be able to trust what people tell us? I mentioned my worries about the Rwanda sample earlier. Um, one of my co a colleague of mine, Simin Vazir, who is a professor at UC Davis, <coughs> made a point a few, uh, earlier this year that if you ask someone who had just been to a divorce, right, who was unhappy, that, oh, you know, I'm sure something good came out of it, and that your friend said, no, nothing, right? You probably leave thinking, oh, that's a little strange. And the reason why you leave thinking it's strange because it's because there are cultural norms associated with looking on the bright side. When someone's going through something, they generally say, yeah, but at least I have my Fridays free now. Or at least I don't have to cook for him or her, right? You know, the elite, they, they're always going to spin it in a positive way. So there might be issues when you ask people about questions related to post traumatic growth about, about self-report. And getting figuring out specifically the context in which this would be an issue and what, what, for what types of questions is an important area for future research. It's also worth thinking about what other as use, useful assessments of post-traumatic growth would be. So, one assessment technique that's been used is the electronically activated recorder, or the ear, right? which you just like uh, lock onto your uh, uh, 
to your belt or whatever you're wearing and then randomly at multiple times a day it'll just record whatever ambient noise is around. So you, it pretty much gives you a snapshot of what your post, whatever it is you're doing. And then researchers code those uh, recordings for behaviors, for whatever, whatever you're saying at the moment, and extract behavioral codings from that. And it might be, depending on the, the dimension you're interested in, that behavioral coding might be more helpful for us to understand the nature of personality change point adversity compared to self-reports. Finally, well, before I get to my final point, we also need to distinguish between growth that occurs due to trauma and normative growth. Right? People do change across the lifespan. Right? People, people become more agreeable over time, less open over time, for example. Right? How do we distinguish those types of normative patterns from growth that we believe occurs as a result of adversity? And finally, we need to be clear, theoretically, about what constitutes growth. The five dimensions I noted earlier were five dimensions that Tedeschi and Calhoun developed from, I, you know, I, I, it was a bottom-up approach from the clients and from the war veterans they uh, had worked with, right, from the experience. But if you look at the literature, you will see a vast array of component of uh, dimensions that are assessed when people look at personality change point adversity. Here's another slide. Right? So there are a number of different scales and a number of different dimensions that different researchers using different theoretical frameworks have used to measure post traumatic growth and gain some clarity on which dimensions are most likely to change following what types of adverse life experiences would be helpful. And I think it's important for us to get a handle on that before we start going into the field and promoting these interventions. That's it, thank you.